Hello. A little awkward pause and uncomfortable, rainy and dreary. You guys are boring me already. Can you stand up, please? Just stand up and just wiggle a little bit of cells out of you. I mean, come on. Y'all are like, God is falling asleep. Wake up, okay? Oh, my Lord. People act like a little bit of rain, and you're, like, ready to, like, jump off a cliff. Suicide alert. Hotline. You ever listen to a song, and as you're listening to that song, it takes you, it transports you to a place where you once were? It's like Tears for Fears. Well, listen to the, any song by Tears for Fears. Sixth grade. Big crush on Kristen McNeely. Sometimes when I read the Bible, it transports me to where I was the first time I really remembered reading that passage of Scripture. And uh, the story of Joseph, you guys, that's, I love that story. And even though I'd grown up hearing that story my whole life, even though I've read it many times, the time that really impacted me the most is when I watched the story on video. You all ever watch the TNT, Ted Turner's version of, of uh, the, the, some of the Old Testament stories? It was about 1996, 1997. I had just come from the dentist's office. In, in fact, I had went to an oral surgeon, and I had four molars taken out. Now, if any of you who know me or even barely know me, you can probably tell I'm not a very good patient. And so I had these molars taken out. I was weeping. I was sobby. He had given me every kind of narcotic drug known to man. My girlfriend at the time who I was dating, she picked me up and she drove me to my apartment. She got out and opened the door for me. I ba barely hobbled out of the car. Blood was spewing out of my mouth. I was putting cotton balls in. She closed the door, went back to her other side of her car, and sped off. And I knew that at that moment that that terrible person would never be my wife. I went, and I, couldn't even I didn't even have the energy to get to my bed. I, I just laid down and crashed on the floor, and I kneeled, and I crawled over, and I put the Joseph video into my TV, and I laid there in this drug-induced coma watching Joseph <laughs> thrown into the bed. <laughs> and there he was now, next to the pharaoh, coming there, standing before his brothers. You guys, it was good stuff. I wept. I really, I wept. I cried and I cried and I cried. I don't know if it was because of the story of Joseph or the pain that I was feeling, but I've never forgotten that awesome story of Joseph. You know, as we take a deeper look into the life of Joseph, we discover someone who had experienced failure, abandonment, and disappointment. And as Pastor Dave Gemmel uh, shared last week on um, the complexity and the dysfunction of family systems. Uh, it helped propel the story of this teenage boy and the lifetime of heartache that he had experienced. Just a very quick overview on the life of Joseph. Around the age of 17, Joseph, um, his brothers turn on him and they throw him into a, a pit. Uh, in fact, it was a cistern, a dry cistern, um, they throw him into the pit to die. And then they decide to, instead of letting him die there, they decide to sell him as a slave. And they put him on this caravan that he heads off into Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, he gets this job as a, as a slave. And, and his boss's wife accuses him of attempted rape. And he's thrown into prison. And then while he's in prison, he makes friends with the king's cupbearer and the the, uh, the king's cupbearer and the king's baker. And, and he does these good deeds towards them. And as they leave prison, 
the only thing he asks for them, he says, will you please remember me when you get out and help me get out? And they forget all about him. I'm not sure about you, but the disappointment that Joseph experienced throughout his life is unimaginable. Uh, most of us can never experience the kind of sadness, the kind of failure, the disappointed, dis- disappointment that he experienced in his short time. I remember a few years ago, probably about five or six years ago, everything in my life was going well. Everything. I had, we had our second child. We were about to buy a new house, uh, have this awesome, loving, caring, hot wife. I mean, nothing can go wrong. And I remember going to prayer meeting, and I said, you know, my life is going so well, I feel like I need to ask God to put in some struggles. People don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that. Just be happy with God's blessings. I said, Lord, I need you to give me a trial in my life. Imagine the culture shock that Joseph experienced upon arriving in Egypt. Here he was, probably a 17-year-old boy is what we believe, who had lived his life as a nomad in the countryside um, with his father, taking care of the sheep. And suddenly he's thrust into the world's most advanced civilization in Egypt with the great pyramids and the beautiful homes, the sophisticated people, the new languages. Have you ever experienced a disappointment in your life? Have you ever been abandoned by someone that you loved? Are you perhaps in the middle of weathering a storm that seems to be unfair or unbearable? Uh, Perhaps there's some nugget of truth that you and I can learn today from the story of Joseph. You know, when we go through difficult, difficult times in our life, it's very easy for us to blame others. And usually others can be at blame. In fact, when you're going through a a hard time, if you've been fired from a job, if you're going through a divorce, a lot of people will give you a lot of slack because they know you're going through a hard time. Am I right? And they say, you know what? I don't blame you. Take your time. Go go through the, the mourning process. It's fine. And for many of us, in fact, for almost all of us, when we're going through a difficult time, we know intellectually that we can get away with a lot of stuff because people know we're having a hard time in our life. And so it's easy for us to blame other people. It's easy for us to, to, co- to condemn other people. It's easy for us to feel terrible about ourselves. But what I want to share with you today is that oftentimes what we have to focus on is not other people, but our own character. You see, everyone's going to allow us to blame other people. No one is going to tell you, you know what, you should focus on your own character and see how you and God can be at better places in your life right now. And for so often, we, you know, take advantage of the difficult times that are happening in our life. Instead of asking two questions, one, how can my character grow right now? And two, how is my relationship with God affecting the way that I'm going through a difficult circumstance in my life? First thing I want to share with you is focus on your character, not on others. Focus on your character, not on who? Others. others. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, um, if you guys are, are in psychology or, or, or in, um, uh, in, in counseling, you, you understand that the, the Kubler-Ross model is what we call the five stages of grief. Uh, and all of us go through this in some shape or form. In fact, uh, she wrote this book um, because she realized that as people were dying, um, the medical institutions um, did not fully understand how to deal with people as they were grieving death. And then as psychologists started to understand this five-stage process, they realized that it's not only in death that people grieve, but people grieve for many other reasons, and we had to be able to understand these five stages. The first one is denial. I'm fine, I'm fine, no, no, it's fine. I don't want to talk about it. It's, it's, it's fine, just, just, it's, it's okay, just leave me alone. The second one is anger. Why me? It's not fair. Do you realize what, how much I love this person? Do you realize how much I did for this person? Why would they, why would God allow them to just? The second one is bargaining. And this happens a lot in divorces. And that, and and, and, and in in, in a grieving stage for, for, for dying, it's, it's the idea of, you know, if he would have just, if I could have lived instead, 
if I could have died instead, instead of, instead of them, them dying. Or, you know what, the bargaining process is, if you don't leave me, I promise I'll make a lot of changes in my life. Am I getting too personal here? The next one is depression. I'm so sad. My life is so terrible. I, you know, I'm going to die anyways. I, I don't even care. You know, I, I might as well just give up right now. And the final stage is acceptance. You know what? I've, I'm going through a really difficult time, but I'm going to be able to manage it. A little slide right here, uh, a little cartoon I want you to look at that kind of explains these five um, things. Denial. I bet they were all lying. I bet none of them finished either. This is talking about taking a test in school. Anger. What kind of moron wrote that test? We didn't learn any of that stuff. Bargaining. Hmm. Maybe I can make a donation to the college board and they'll give me a better score. Depression. My life is over. I'll never get anywhere in life and then I'll die alone. Acceptance. Whatever. It's not like I'll ever need Spanish in the real world. <laughs> it can be convenient to blame others. And where we're going through a dark valley and, it, and the blame can be pinpointed on others' behaviors or, or poor moral decision that others made, it's easy for us to focus on their character rather than focusing on our own character and how we're being shaped. Most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about their own character and how they can stand in their relationship with God. Earlier this week, I was talking to a good friend of mine who, was, who came to see me in, in my office. And this friend uh, went through his own Joseph experience several years ago. Uh, he was a teacher in the prime of his life. He was enjoying his profession. He had moved cross-country to, to, to go after his dreams. He was highly involved in his local church. And, and then all of a sudden, a student accused him of engaging in a sexual act with her. And even though he denied every wrongdoing... All the way through the court trial, all the way through his sentencing, he was still convicted and sentenced to prison. And I looked at him this week, and I asked him for permission to tell the story. I said, B, how do you get up every day knowing that people look at you in the eyes, and what they see is a convicted sex offender, somebody who was convicted and sentenced? I said, how do you come to this church knowing that that's what people see? And his response to me was this, Kumar, I can't go through life concerned about what people are thinking about me. I can only be concerned with my character and how God, and how God looks at me. For some of you here today, you and I are sometimes so worried about what others are thinking about us when really all we need to be thinking about is how does God look at you? And can you stand before God during the difficult times of your life, whether you've been accused of wrongdoing or whether you've been accused of something you never did, and still come before God and know that it's all about you and, and God and nothing else? Joseph went through many crises in his short period. Uh, he went through a crisis, and then... In that crisis, we see in the narrative how his character is built out of this. You and I are going to go through many crises in life. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, in that crisis, how is your character withstanding? You know, there's a saying, you know, if you go through dark, you know, difficult times, it's just, you know, how does it say, what's the saying? You know, the, thank you, something about sandpaper, and, you, know, you all know what I'm saying. And you know, the other side, you come out all soft. No. I want to say to you, even when you're going through this difficult time, don't worry to get on the other end being all soft with the sandpaper. Go through the beginning soft with your character in God. Take a look at what Joseph went through. The first crisis he went through, Genesis 37, 36. It says, meanwhile, the Midianite tra traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph into Potiphar, to Potiphar. An officer of Pharaoh, the king of the Egypt, Pharaoh, Potiphar was the captain of the palace guard. What was the crisis? Come on, people. It's right up there. He sold into slavery, right? 
And in being sold into slavery, the question we ask is, how does Joseph's character come out through that? Look at the next verse, 39 verse 2. It says, the Lord was with who? Who was with Joseph? The Lord. And so he succeeded in everything that he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian matter, a master. And let me point something out. The point is not that he succeeded in everything he did. The point is that God was with him. And when you and I are going through dark times, the point is not whether or not you're going to succeed out of that. You may not succeed out of that dark pit in your life. What matters is whether you succeed or you don't succeed, that the Lord is with you. Next one. 39, verse 19 to 20, it says, Potiphar was furious when he heard whose story? His wife's story. He didn't even bother talking to Joseph because he's a slave. When he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. And so he took Joseph and did what? Threw him in the prison where the king's prisoners were held. I should say held. Folks, just because it says a king's prison doesn't mean it's like, it's like the good prison. It means if you really make the king angry, you're going to be in the worst pit ever. And so he was put in, in a very dark circumstance because he was placed in where the, the king's enemies were. How does his character come out of this? Verse 21 to 23, it says, And the who? And the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him what? Unfaithful love. Somebody, you need to say Amen. When you are in the prison in your lifetime, in a, a metaphorical prison, whatever, figurative prison, when you are going through that darkest time, what you want, no matter what, is God's unfaithful love to be with you. It says that he ended up succeeding. The point is not that he succeeded. The point is that the Lord was with him, and he showed his unfaithful love towards him. When you're going towards a dark time, what you and I have to do, did I say the right, wrong word? My wife's a speech pathologist. What did I say? His faithful, unfaithful, unfaithful, his faithful. Genesis 41. Two full years later. How long later? People, this guy, is it, you, all, you all going through your own dark time. Six weeks has passed by. You've been talking about it every day on Facebook. Tired of looking at you. Got to hide your problems from my own posts. This guy's going through this for two years. Two years. Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank, on the bank of the Nile River. And Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, and he was quickly brought to the prison. And after he had shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means. But I've heard that you, that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. What's the crisis here? This guy's being forced to perform. And oftentimes when we're forced to perform and when we perform successfully, it's very easy for us to take the credit instead of giving it away to God. Next slide. It says, it is beyond, this is Joseph saying, it is beyond my power to do this, but God can tell me what it means and set you at ease. Folks, even when we're going through dark times, God is giving us the ability to give comfort to other people. Somebody say hello. And so Pharaoh's asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? when we go through difficult circumstances in our life, the question that we want others to ask is whether or not God is being reflected in our life. Are you so filled with rage? Are you so filled with anger? Are you so filled with guilt that people cannot even see the presence of God in your life? People are going to hurt you. Do you know that? Life is going to hurl rocks in your direction. Do you know that? 
And what you and I have to be careful of is not playing the blame game. Not to engage with your haters. Not to plan revenge on them. But to live our lives with integrity. Because what matters in life is how you and I stand before God and no one else. There's a verse in Lamentations 5, verse 11. It says, turn back, turn us back, O Lord. We will be restored. Stored. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. You guys, let me tell you something. You're going to be surprised when I say this. This is a prayer that I pray that I never have to pray to God. This is a prayer that I never have to pray to God. I hope that I never have to ask God to turn me back towards him. My prayer is, Lord, keep me in the right direction of your faithfulness. The second thing I want to share with you is to accept where God has placed you. Perhaps you're not happy with your life, where your life is. Perhaps you thought you would be married by now. Perhaps you thought you would have finished college by now. You know, one of my very good friends, every time I see him, he says, my greatest disappointment is that I haven't finished college. Dude, you're 38 years old. Go back. Perhaps you haven't achieved your goal up to this time in life. You see, Joseph never imagined that he would be sold into slavery. He never anticipated being separated from his family, especially his father and his brother Benjamin. Life had turned, had, had, had all of a sudden, there was interesting curveballs being thrown to him and the trajectory of his path that he never was expecting. And I'm sure that Joseph thought that by this time in his life that he'd be married to a nice Hebrew girl, taking care of his father's sheep. He never imagined that he'd be put into slavery into a foreign land, given a brand new name, forced to learn a brand new language, uh, be given to, in marriage to an Egyptian woman. But Joseph did something that so many of us have a hard time doing, and that is to accept where God has placed you right now. Take a look at 41, verse 50 to 52. It says, During this time before the first of the famine, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife, Aseneth. Joseph named his older son Manasseh, for he said, listen to me very carefully, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in who? This man's coming to terms, isn't he? This man has gone through a difficulty in his life, and all of a sudden, as he looks at his sons, and he looks at the new birth that God has given him, and this often happens when we have children of our own, we recognize that God is giving us an opportunity to start over. God is giving us an opportunity to break the dysfunction of our family life, the family systems, and to start over with these new children. And so when he has this first son, he looks at him and he says, God has given me the opportunity to start over, to forget my past, to forget my father and his sons, and to move on and then he has a second son named Ephraim and what does it say it says I named him because of what I named him because God has prospered me in this land of my what grief sounds like someone who's healing isn't it sounds like someone who's moving forward he's saying with my second child i realized that this is going to be permanent you know some of you who have moved to maryland you thought you're going to be moving back home back to mommy and daddy now years have gone by and you're like having kids and bought a house and you're kind of now settling and realizing that you're not going home this is home sweet home live with it And so his second son, it, it helps him realize that this is now where he is going to be placing and planting his roots. And when we realize that this is the place that God has put us here for now, then it gives us the ability to heal and move on. Can somebody relate to the story? It's only when God, it's only when we come to terms with our pain and accept the current location that God has placed us in, that change can occur. Five models of grief, the last one is what? Acceptance. It's only when you accept where you have been placed by God that you can be healed. 
the final lesson I want to share with you today is forgiveness is the ultimate revenge. Forgiveness is the ultimate revenge. Somebody say, I don't know about that. You see, when someone has broken you, when you put your trust in others and they've destroyed that, it affects the way that you can build new friendships and relationships. It can cripple the way that you make decisions in your life. Some reasons not to forgive others is, is because the trust has been broken. It's because you've experienced true humiliation and anger and hurt. It's because it has reopened a wound that you thought was closed. And finally, it's because one of the reasons we do not forgive is because we've experienced deep betrayal in our lives. Has anyone here experienced any of those things in your life? Some of you are going through it right now. And you're wondering whether or not it's even worth forgiving the person that has brought so much problems into your life. As we said earlier, Joseph thought he would never see his family again. He named one of his sons. I'll never see my family again. And in most of the story, Joseph is seen as a strong, capable, God-fearing person uh, there isn't a dark side of Joseph. There isn't a vindictive side of Joseph. When you read this story, it's very easy to think of this guy just letting everything get off of him. And he's not being bothered by all the weight that he's been, that he's been, been going through. But I want you to read it through a different um, set of lenses. You know, sometimes we grow up, grew up reading this um, passage of scripture, especially through like my Bible friends, and it sugarcoats the whole story. I want you to read these through a different set of lenses and showing the carnal side that comes out of Joseph when he is finally able to confront the people that destroyed his life. How would you act? How would you react if somebody, um, the person that, that ruined your life were, were to be in front of you right now? 42, verse 42. It says, when, Joseph heard that, when Jacob heard that the grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you standing around at one another? I've heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we will die. You guys, you see, sometimes we're motivated only by our own selfish desires to live. Sometimes we're motivated because we have to survive. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, to go with him for fear that some might come to harm him. Some harm might come to, uh, to him. So Jacob's son arrived in Egypt along with others to buy food, for the famine was in the Canaan as well. And since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, he, it was him that his brothers came to. And when they arrived, they bowed down before him with their faces to what? Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. Oh, 22 years have passed up to this point now. And he still recognized the, the ugly brothers of Leah. Ugly sons of Leah, I should say. And Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, and he pretended to be a stranger and spark, ho and spark harshly to them. Where are you from? You see, his carnal side is coming out now. These guys have put him out for, all, for 22 years. He's going to give it to them. He's going to stick it to them right now. Where have you come from? He, said, he yells at them. From the land of Canaan, they replied. We come to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams that they had about him many years before. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. No, my lord, they exclaimed. Your servant have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. Yes, you are, he insisted. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Verse 13. Sir, they said, there are actually 12 of us. Now, how many showed up? There are actually 12 of us. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a living man in the, in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother... Youngest brother is back with their father right now. And one of our brothers is what? No longer with us. You see, when you're facing your enemies, the truth is going to come out. 
But Joseph insisted, as I said, you are spies. This is how I'll test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh that you will never leave Egypt unless your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother, and I'll keep the rest of you in prison. Then we'll find out whether your story is true. And by the life of Pharaoh... If it turns out that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know you are spies. And so he's furious. And the Bible says in verse 17, he says, And then Joseph put them all in prison. He's, vind- he, he's vindicated. Right? Put them in the king's prison. I'm going to show you how I live. Yeah, you're, you're going to get it. And we finally see this different side of Joseph, this carnal, angry, vindictive side. And after ruining his life, selling him into slavery into a foreign land, it is now time for him to get his revenge. What does Romans 12, 19 says? Dear friends, never take what? Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of who? Of God. Never take revenge. I will take revenge, and I will pay them back, says the Lord. And so all of a sudden, we see this trajectory of Joseph. He goes through a crisis, but his character stands firm. He goes through a crisis, his character stands firm. He goes through a crisis, his character stands firm. And now he's going through this crisis of his brothers, and the question is whether or not his character will be representative of the rest of his life. Look at verse 18, verse chapter 42. It says, On the third day, Joseph said to them, I am what? I'm a God-fearing man. If you do as I say, you will live. It took him three days to kind of calm down. It took him three days to kind of realize that it is only about him and his relationship with God and no others. It took him for three days to finally realize that he's not going to gain by putting his brothers into a miserable life like he had experienced. But in order for him to live the life of integrity that that he has with God, he has to do the right thing and allow his brothers to live. How did Joseph forgive his brothers? That's a good question, isn't it? And when we talk about forgiveness, um, one of the things we, especially in American terminology and in, 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 in American culture, we talk about forgiving but not forgetting. Uh, forgiving means to forget. When we look biblically at, what, at forgiveness, if we do a study on forgiveness, what we realize is to forgive somebody means that you are now giving them back and restoring them to where they once were. I want you to think about the idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not saying, you know what, I'm going to forgive you, and I just don't ever want to see you again. Forgiving is to say, I'm going to forgive you and restore you back to the level that you once were. When God forgives us, he's not forgiving us on conditions, right? When he forgives us, he's forgiving us and bringing us back to our position with him. And so when we talk about forgiveness, and when you're thinking about forgiving those people in your life, the question you have to ask yourself is, is, am I willing to bring them back to the same level that they once were? Look and see how Joseph forgave. Verse 16. It says, when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of his household, these men will eat with me this noon, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. These men are going to eat with me immediately. At noon, take them inside the palace. And then go slaughter an animal. Don't bring just leftover some last night's dinner. Don't bring a microwave meal over. Go and get the best meal possible. Slaughter an animal and prepare a what? Big feast. So the man did as Joseph told them and told them in, and, and took them into Joseph's palace. When his brothers had kicked him out of their own home, Joseph brought them back into his own home. Verse 24. The manager then led the men into Joseph's palace. He gave them water to wash their feet and provided food for their donkeys. They were told that they were going to be eating there, so they prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon. When his brothers 
took the only thing that mattered to him, his personal multicolored robe that his own father had quilted for him and shredded into pieces, Joseph cared for their personal belongings as if it was his own. Verse 34. And Joseph filled their plates with food from his what? Now, I, I, I don't have time to go into this, but there are two different tables. There was the Hebrew table and the Egyptian table. The Hebrews could not, st- pardon me, the Egyptians could not stand the Hebrews, and so they refused to even eat from them. And so what Joseph is doing is he has them separated, but at the same time, he is taking food from his dish, the governor's dish, and bringing it to them to eat. And so they feasted and they drank freely with him. When his brothers dumped him in a dry cistern to starve to death, to Joseph responds by caring for their basic needs of food and drink beyond what they ever needed. When you forgive a person, it allows you to move forward in your own life. It gives you the strength to take the next steps in your own life towards healthy living. Literally healthy living. Some of you guys know the Mayo Clinic, world-renowned Mayo Clinic. They've done studies on, on why we should let go of grudges and bitterness and make way for compassion and kind kindness. They say that kindness can, can lead to the following physical aspects of our lives. Number one, healthier relationships. Number two, greater spiritual and psychological well-being. Number three, less anxiety, stress, and hostility. Number four, lower blood pressure. Number five, fewer symptoms of depression. And number six, lower risk of alcohol and substance abuse by just forgiving other people in your life. I know that some of you have been waiting for the person or people in your life who hurt you to repent and ask for forgiveness. Some of you have been waiting for years, even decades, waiting for somebody to say, if they would only take the responsibility of their failure and actually admit to me what they did. Listen to me very carefully. There are some people who do not have the power within them to ever admit their failure to you. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is two things. Number one, if you want forgiveness, if you want someone to to ask for forgiveness of you, if you want the person who hurt you so badly to come and come to you and ask them to forgive you, then maybe what you have to be able to do is to ask them to ask for forgiveness. That's hard, isn't it? But sometimes they are not going to be willing to do it because they cannot even do it within their own selves. They know what they did. They know what they did was wrong. But they, are, they, they don't even have the self-actualization to come to you and, and ask you for forgiveness. And if you want it so badly, then sometimes you need to just ask them to do, to do it. Uh, most people in, the, in our lives, most bad people that we say are bad, didn't wake up and say, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be a monster. I'm going to make this person's life miserable. What they're actually doing is they're just repeating the dysfunction and the cycle that they know from their own past, and they're putting it upon you. And the person that gave them the the, the bad cycle, they never came to them and asked for forgiveness, so they don't even know how to articulate forgiveness. The second thing is to forgive that person because they deserve it. Because Jesus forgives you and I daily. Oh, that is hard, isn't it? Kumar, you don't know what I've gone through. You don't know the pain that I have been through. And for you to have the right to stand here and say that I should forgive somebody, hey, I'm not saying this. You made the decision on your own. I'm just offering you some suggestions that if God can forgive us on a daily basis, perhaps we can forgive other people. Last week, Pastor Gemmel spoke about family systems, the dysfunctions from generation to generation, family systems that can be filled with lies and half-truths and and survival mechanisms and and terrible secrets that exist in dysfunction. You know, the only way to break a dysfunctional cycle is to break the secret. And for many people today, we are stuck in these systems in our own lives. I I want you to look at this very quickly. We're running out of time, so I'm going to move very quickly. 
there are two opportunities in this passage of Scripture for Joseph's brothers to actually come clean. Okay? The first one is when they were with Joseph. He didn't, they didn't know it was him. And they said there were 12 of us instead of 10, but there was 10 with them, right? And they said the, the other one has left. We've lost the other one. They were, had the opportunity to say, we made a terrible decision, uh, and, and we sold our brother into slavery. But they could not do it as a group, in the group dynamics, to actually come up and confess their sin. The second part is when they go back to Egypt and they tell their, their father what happened. The, the Bible says they told him everything, and then it repeats what they told Joseph. But they didn't tell him everything. They couldn't say to their father, we took, sent your son into slavery and hoped that he was going to be dead. And so oftentimes in our own lives, uh, th there are people who cannot come up and actually uh, admit their own failure. This is probably the hardest part of forgiveness. And that is understanding how God is using our own pain to help others. Did you hear me? I want to be very careful what you hear me say. I'm not saying that God gave you the problem to help others. I'm not saying that you're a child of incest and abuse and rape because God deemed that to you. What I'm saying is the hardest part of forgiveness is to recognize, the hardest part of moving on is to recognize that even through your pain and heartache, you can now see how God can use that pain to help others. Joseph could no longer stand it. And there were so many people in the room that he said to his attendants, out, all of you! And so he was alone with his brothers, and when he t told them who he was. And he broke down and he wept, and he wept so loudly, this is the ugly cry, so loudly, the Egyptians in the other room could hear him, and word of it carried quickly to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please, he says, come closer to me. Do you have that power within you to bring people to, who have hurt you the most into your closest sphere of your life? And so they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt, slavery into Egypt. But don't be upset. And don't be angry with yourselves for se se selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine has ravaged the land for two years, and, and it will last five more years. And there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve as many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And it is he is the one who made me an advisor of Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace, the governor of all of Egypt. Some of you today are going through a very dark moment in your life. Uh, you have been withstanding pain and humiliation. You have felt rejected. You are unsure if you're going to be able to get out of the pit on your own. And today is the day, my friends, for you to be able to look up to heaven and say, God, I need you to rescue me. I cannot do this on my own. I need you. I need you. I need you, oh God, the God that I believe in with all my heart to pull me out of this and rescue me.